Rudolf Nuhrian. The critics have exhausted their fund of superlatives. The audiences have cheered until their voices have departed. Today, in our own time, the tradition of the supreme dancer flames again in the blazing intensity of this young disciple of movement. such an incredible story that a man uh, escaped at the time from the KGB and he jumps. The story hits like an atom bomb. It, it was like a film. It was incredible. And this is the last time I will speak <laughs> of Rudolf. <laughs> Nureyev was in danger. He betrayed his country. The KGB had plans to destroy him. He said to me, one have to hide myself behind the iron curtain. For him, freedom was something new. <laughs> Telling the truth is not always the best thing. He was a difficult partner. You know, he was such a star. He wanted to conquer the world, and it, it was his right to conquer the world. It was a miracle. A miracle. One day, while I was walking along the gallery of the rehearsal studio, I saw a young dancer I hadn't seen before. His stature was exquisite. The tension in his body, the extension he got in his arabesque. He was unique. He wasn't perfect. But Nuryev was so exciting. He had an enormously expressive technique of revolving on the very tips of his toes. You could feel his expression. Of course, we were looking at him with great interest. Whenever he had classes, we always came to see how he trained. The same classroom we are in now. We all felt very privileged that we got into this famous school. It was the dream of every young dancer. It was very hard to get a place. And so when Rudy climbed so quickly to dance as a soloist, this was just unprecedented. The person that made that happen was a woman who chose him as a partner. Natalia Dudanskaya. Dudinska was a prima ballerina. Dancers aren't different like that anymore. But she was a prima ballerina back then. The grandest of them all. She was our inspiration, first of all. The company treated her with great respect. Natalia Dudinskaya had been a huge star from the 1930s. Her husband, Konstantin Sergeyev, was the artistic director of the Kirov. 
He was a very important dancer for the company and a noble one, someone who represented the ideal Soviet dancer. But Sergeyev and Noyev had a very complicated relationship. Stop. Stop, stop, stop. Спасибо. Uh, Rudolf, как вы встаете? Покажите, пожалуйста. А зачем выворотно? У нас принято так. Нет, извините. У нас принято так. Выворотно здесь не нужна. Что значит не нравится? Мое время закончилось. Sergeyev clearly believed in him as a dancer. He knew that he was capable of carrying the company and carrying those roles with his wife. On the other hand, what Noyev was doing, his behavior within the company was likely very upsetting because Noyev showed no respect. Rudik sounded like a whirlwind, ripping everything apart. He was very impulsive. He would always do something extraordinary, unusual, and every time it was kind of shock for everyone. It was his character. He would just snap. He had a terrible temper. He was so rude and insulting, but he was honest, childlike. So somehow you were on his side. Rudy had rivals in a professional sense. Yuri Solovyev had a great natural talent. He had what we call soft legs. He could take off and achieve such fantastic height with his jump that he was compared to Gagarin. He was called Cosmic Yuri because he could keep himself in the air for a longer time than Nariv. But the most talented dancers aren't those who rely on their natural talents, but those who can overcome any shortcomings they have. And that's what made Rudolf great. He was a great dancer, but he had bad attitude. We had traditions. It was our responsibility as students to watch the floor after class. Rudik would never do it. Rudolf! Rudolf! Вы должны пойти и полить пол. Вы меня слышите? Рудольф! Я работаю. Руди сказал, нет, я пол, пол поливать. He spoke like a prince to his servant. To Sergeyev, if you can believe it. He was not just the head of the theater, but one of Russia's best dancers of the 20th century. Yuri Solovyev appeared and said to him, water it immediately or I'll beat you up. Yuri was quite a big boy. He did it, but he was so angry because he was made to water the floor like the rest of us mortals. Their characters were very different. Nureyev's temperament meant he pushed and pushed the whole time. Yuri was less driven to get the good parts. He had patience. Rudolf was impatient. Of course, he was a part of the Kirov Theatre Company, but he was always an outsider. He had no friends there. A part of the collective, but a very individual part. I became his confidant. I wasn't a dancer, so there was no jealousy. I was just happy to share in his success. He loved being photographed. When he looked at my photos, he said, Look at this real narcissist. He loved it that something would remain of these moments. Going to Paris meant a lot to him. He really wanted to go on that tour. I remember how obsessed he was with the idea of Paris. 
Norway had great expectation because in 1961, it was the very first time the company toured in the West. The company was founded um, in 1730, and no one, and in any way, they never came to the West. Hi, Peter. We're happy billet. By the time the Kirov was deciding on the final roster for the tour, Nuryev knew that he was on his final warning, and um, a meeting was held to reprimand him for his behavior. The title of the meeting was the conduct of party member Nuryev. And I said to Rudik, this is your last chance. I beg you, please don't say anything to make them mad. But Rudik always created tension with the KGB, the controlling organizations, as we say. How would he behave? But then again, he was unique in our theater. Like him or loathe him, there was nobody like him. On stage, he would be the center of attention. Не подобающее поведение на репетициях, не соблюдение норм классического танца, неуважение по отношению к членам труппы и руководящему составу. Пренебрежение к костюму, товарищи, все мы помним, как артист Нуреев снял шорты во время балета Жизель и танцевал в лосинах. Как все прошло? Хорошо. Ты не грубил? Нет. Я сказал пару слов Соловьеву. Ты оскорбил Юрия? Нет. Вам для гастролей. Нужна посредственность, скачущая по сцене. Пожалуйста. Нет, это не пишите. He told me that in the meeting he was only given a verbal reprimand, so that meant he would be able to go abroad on the tour. Nothing was written down in his file. And I said, Rudik, don't you realize you've really insulted Yuri Solovyov? Yuri was stung by that insult, and it stayed with him. <laughs> Rudolf hadn't been chosen. Everyone knows, if you are going to take anyone, take Rudolf. We try to calm him down and control his emotions. This was a despair for him. There was another reason. Nureyev had the same repertoire as Sergeyev. And Sergeyev wanted to dance again. Sergeyev and Dudin Sketch were hoping that those performances would be a swan song that would allow them to have a final triumph in the West as dancers of the Kirov. But the chance came with a young French lady called uh, Janine Ringue. And Janine Ringue was sent to um, Leningrad to see the company and to organize the tour and to organize also the cast. And Konstantin Sergeyev told her, OK, you've seen uh, all the ballets that should come to Paris. And in the evening, she saw that uh, Don Quixote had to be performed. She said, well, there's Don Quixote. I would like to see it, maybe in Strestic. And Sergeyev told her, no, it's very old production. You will probably not uh, appreciate it. Don't go, it's, it's really no interest. She had a seat. And Janine understood that she just found her star. And she sent a, a telegram to her boss saying, I've have found the best dancer of the world. 
and her producer uh, answered her, Janine, you're a little too young to say that. But she was right. <laughs> I remember it's like it was yesterday. He is running towards me. I will be dancing in Paris, he said. 2-0, we win. Sergei gave me Swan Lake and Sleeping Beauty. So this is already the poor Nureyev was, he just wanted to dance, he was refused and suddenly he became a political problem. And politically, it was a very difficult time. The Kirov would arrive at the top of the Cold War. Well, 61 uh, was an extraordinary year. I mean, this is the year of the Cuban Revolution. This is the period of the building of the Berlin Wall. It's also the year when the Soviet Union put Yuri Gagarin, the first man up in space. And this showed that the Soviet Union was scientifically and technologically ahead of the Americans. They were winning the Cold War. With the Kirov, we will take this culture out to the West to show to you that the Soviet Union is not only technologically superior, we have a superior culture. So the Kirov coming as it, as it did in 1961 was an extraordinary step forward for the Soviet Union and of course an extraordinary moment in the history of the Cold War. This was going to be a crucial tour, an important mission for the KGB. A huge company traveling, performing in major Western capitals, Paris and London, which meant security and surveillance was paramount. The operative agent in charge was specially chosen. He was Vitaly Strishevsky. I think he was sent from Moscow. Strishevsky's main task was to prevent Nureyev from being involved in any kind of scandal. And the KGB had to ensure this person stayed within the bounds of socialist realism, as we used to say. He was an interesting looking man, but I have to say these accompanying guys, as we call them, these agents, they were a special breed. You could tell from their walk. He isn't a dancer, he isn't a director or a coach, he is a accompanying guy. This were the company, it suited him, the one who follows your behavior abroad. А вы товарищ Нуриев, как всегда, вовремя. А вы летите с нами? Нет, нет, я провожаю. Вы провожаете, очень хорошо. Ну надо же, ваш паспорт. He knew that Nuri was considered rude, ambitious, vain. He was just a complete anarchist. Товарищи артисты, по очереди подходим на таможню, ничего не забываем, документы в раскрытом виде. I came with them to the airport, and the rumor went round that somebody was going to be prevented from going. When Rudik heard this, he went pale. I said, Rudik, relax. Nobody can take your place. That's not true, he said. In fact, it was a member of the corps de ballet who was sent back, nothing to do with Rudolf. But in the heat of the moment, he was sure it was him, for all his sins. Paris was a fairy tale. It was a dream. It was charged with a sense of freedom. Paris is a movable feast, as Hemingway said. It 
filled me with joy. I felt so comfortable there. See, I'm shivering just thinking about it. It made me feel that I could be liked. I can be loved and achieve success. I could break out of the way I'd been taught to think about myself. Внимание, товарищи артисты! Товарищи артисты, тишина! Пожалуйста, распределитесь, кто с кем в каком номере будет жить. И подходите получать ключи. Once they got there, who on earth could bear to share a room with Rurik? Кто с Нуриевым? Кто с Нуриевым? It seemed to be that he was always tense and on edge. I could never have done it. I never felt any personal connection with Rudolf. The two great individualists of the company ended up in the same room. That was a surprise. One with an enormous jump, the other with an enormous attitude. They make a big reception in Paris Opera, you know, to introduce dancer for the press. This reception was in the Foyer de la Danse, just behind the, the stage in Paris Opera. And it was very strange because all the Russian was in one side and the French was to the right side. And in the middle was the photographer and the press. In front of us, we could watch the, the Russian and they looked very strange, you know, very old-fashioned. Only one boy was different of the other one, and we just noticed him immediately. He said, look, this one is different. Little by little, he moved behind all the other one, crossed behind the photograph and the press, and came to us and started to speak. Oh, I'm Rodolphe Nuri. I don't speak French, but I speak English very good. We started to talk, and he was talking in English already. And uh, he asked question, and we said, why don't we go to dinner with him if he's interesting? And we asked him, oh, yes, I would like very much to go with you and talk to you, ask you a lot of questions, but I need the permission. Permission? Il a besoin de la permission pour aller dîner? We went uh, to talk to Sergeyev. To show Rodolphe Paris? I think it's a very good idea. Paris for Rodolphe? Yes. No, it's not so good idea. And he looks so embarrassed. He said, oh, no, no, you know, you need, uh, it's difficult. And they are, the company, they are tired. They need to go to bed very early. And Rodolphe is tired too. I'm not tired. <laughs> yes, but you know, we need another person. He could not go alone. I said, but give us another dancer, it doesn't matter. So finally, they give us Solovyov. How many theaters are in Paris? There are a lot of theaters. How many people are your company? Rudolf was talking all the time. Who is your tailor? Do you ever dance? He was very shy, not talking very much. You know. He was very shy, and Rudolf was. Uh, Extrovert. Have you been in Russia? Kirov, the best. You will see. What roles do you dance? He was very, very curious about everything. And he asked questions about ballet, the tradition, the French tradition, the French school. And we started to talk a lot. And suddenly we said, now you have to come back to your hotel because you need to sleep. OK, OK, OK. So we went to the nearby, he was living at the Place de la République, and we bring uh, the both of them to the hotel. Solovyov go immediately to the hotel, but not Rudolf.
Ça va pas? Il se tient en face du car et il regarde, you know, c'était très étrange. Il était fixé à nous et je lui ai dit, qu'est-ce qui s'est passé? Et donc, je vais dehors. And he said to me, you know, I spent such a wonderful evening. I think it's sad because I'm sure we don't see each other anymore. I said, why? I know because, you know, they give me one permission, maybe me not two permission. I said, don't be silly. Of course we will. No more permission. Um, and there is a, a box of chocolate. And we said, take the box. No, no, no. I take one. Good. <laughs> But if we see each other, I will take Tomorrow or the after tomorrow, and so on. From the start, Nariv was kept under constant surveillance. Clearly, this wasn't going to be easy. Strzezewski needed to use everything in his power to succeed in his mission. Nureyev was not planned for the first night, for the, for the first evening, which was certainly a way for Sergeyev to say, OK, you are on the tour, but you are not on the, on the first evening. Um, but he danced at the rehearsal. And what the Soviets did not know is that there was someone like René Servin who saw Nureyev rehearsing. Nureyev danced the dress rehearsal the day before the opening night, and that's where I first saw him. Immediately, I fell under the spell of this extraordinary young dancer. And he immediately tells to everybody in Paris, there is a star at the Paris Opera. So when Nureyev's stage debut finally came, I could hardly wait. The corps de ballet entered in the middle. They went down the ramp, they turned sideways, and you could see one coming down, then two, then three, then four, up to twelve. And people started clapping, thinking that was all. But then there were twelve more, and then there were more. Another ten. There were 32 in total. It was just extraordinary. We had never seen anything like it, ever. We saw the shades of Bayadère, and then I really saw, I'm not exaggerating, a bomb come on stage. white feather, his blue tunic. This man ran on stage to do his variation. I couldn't believe it. I thought it was like a kamikaze. <laughs> it was new for us. And he kept the attention of everybody. The little boy, when we go outside, he's a great, great, great artist. And he danced like I could not explain, you know.
Noya captured the imagination of Paris. He was so exotic. When he first appeared, the audience couldn't believe their eyes. They couldn't believe what they were seeing. We had a huge success. And then Sergeyev came over to us and said, congratulations, but Rudik, don't forget, it's a Saturday. On Saturdays, you always get an easy and more welcoming audience. Rudik was furious. I took the criticism, swallowed this grain of salt, as we say, but he stormed off. Every actor needs reassurance and good word. He needed it more than anyone. After the show, Sergei said, go talk to him, but not too much, and don't tell him that he's fantastic, it's not necessary. Uh, maybe you are tired. Well, we went to Sturil, and it's wonderful, and he was so happy. He said, well, tonight I want to talk to you. I want to, we, we, we shall meet in the street nearby the hotel. Okay. And the first night, of course, I was very interested because he never saw Clarissa before. She was a wonderful person, very nice, very beautiful, very calm. She knew Le Tout Paris. I mean, she knew everybody in Paris. So it was in a relationship that uh, attracted and uh, was agreeable to Rudolf. Uh, Clarissa, Clarissa was introduced to Nureyev that night. She was a rich, young socialite. Her fiancé was one of the sons of the French culture minister, André Malraux. And I'd say she fell in love with Nureyev. This is uh, Clara. <laughs> Clara Saint is a bit of a mystery in this story. She played a very big role in Nureyev's life in Paris and in his defection, but she was always a very private person. To this day, she refuses to be filmed and even to be photographed. It was incredible. He was 23 years old. He was very curious of everything, you know? And when, when you have someone asking all the time, I want to see this, I want to go there, you know, it's, it's interesting. She was a kind of a little Don Juan at that time, you know, she was very free and uh, maybe she saw uh, the fact of seducing Rudolf uh, like a little challenge like that. But he was gorgeous, I mean, it was quite normal in a way that she was uh, attracted to him. There, there was nothing sexual, it was much more pure. Yeah. He was like a child and I remember he wanted to have a wig. So we went and uh, he wanted to have the wig of uh, Marilyn Monroe, blonde, and the man <laughs> was so surprised also. <laughs> Very quickly, um, Nureyev formed a small, a small circle of friends between Clara Saint and Pierre Lacotte. One night he said, I would like to see a musical West Side Story, I heard it's fantastic. And outside, when we went in the street, he started to dance with cha-cha-cha. At that time, it was the beginning of the rebellion in the, in the Western society, the beginning of the sensation that you can do whatever you want. <laughs> he said, I would like to see a cabaret. And we thought that the Crazy Horse Salon will be a good thing for him to go. So we went there. You know, well, we, we, took, <laughs> we took a table there and uh, he was... Uh, he couldn't believe what, what he saw. The, 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 all the girls, the dance. It's by you much. <laughs> it's perfect. He was so surprised. Surprised and seduced. 
We know today that Nuryev had relationships with both men and women over the course of his life. But in 1961, Nuryev's sexuality was not something that he discussed openly. My opinion is that at this moment, Clara Saint was more in love with Nureyev than her fiancé. I think she was seduced and he became something wonderful and then it, was, it became not easy and not possible. And then she just uh, said, bon tant pis. I love train. I was born on the train. I remember we wanted to have a, a train electric. So I, I went with him to a shop called Le Nain Bleu. Of course, Clara bought him the electric train. Look behind me, there is somebody who will follow us. It's a, a member of the KGB. Were you aware you were being followed? I didn't care, I don't know. Black car, maybe, I don't know. All the time. We, we have the, the, those people behind us, always. And at least one, maybe two. What could we do? Of course, Strzyżewski gathered information about Nuri's friends and their activities together. All his reports were sent back to his KGB superiors in Moscow. He was reporting the developing trend of Nuria's bad behavior. Товарищ Стрижевский, здравствуйте, я как раз к вам. Подскажите мне, пожалуйста, когда у вас есть свободное время в зале? В зале? Да. Вы хотите репетицию в зале? Да, конечно. After the performance, every evening, he would watch for Rudik like a hawk. He just couldn't keep up with Rutik. It was impossible to get him. We would sneak through the kitchen door, through the restaurant, to fool the accompanying man. Who cares? I'll risk it. What's the worst thing that can happen? They won't take me on the next tour. But now I can't live according to my heart. I want to live in Paris like I'm in Paris, not a provincial shithole. He knew he was being followed, openly followed. And one night, when he was in Maxim's, he was being tailed by a woman from the KGB. At one point, he said to the maitre d', Take this bread roll and water and take them to this bitch. She doesn't deserve anything better. And the maitre d' did it, of course. It must have been hard to swallow. I remember Struzhevsky sitting in the lobby in a groggy state, like a suffering Hamlet. What am I to do? <laughs> and when Rudik appeared, he got incensed. It was natural. Once Trishevsky realized that he was not going to be able to stop Noya from seeing his friends and from going out, he started to include them in his reports and to smear them as he went along, in part to cover himself in case anything went wrong. We know from the files that were accessed in the early 1990s after the perestroika that his reports included mention of Clara Saints being a CIA operative. Incroyable. And I was paid also. So you were a paid CIA yes, agent? Yes, yes, I was. <laughs> yes. yes, I was Matahari. 
Стрижевский was feeding Moscow with information. He felt would take the blame of his shoulders and the shoulders of his bosses for the ongoing problems with Nureyev. On the opening night of a ballet called The Stone Flower, I remember Nureyev invited Clara to join him in the box reserved for Soviet artists. Can you imagine the situation? <laughs> this young dancer considered uh, unsubordinate, seeing the performance in the official box with this young lady, very rich, the emblem of capitalism. Sergeyev was furious, of course, but Nureyev just couldn't care less. It was during this performance that Clara learned that her fiancé and her fiancé's brother, the two sons of Marot, had died in a car accident. Of course, it was a terrible shock. It must have been terribly difficult. Rudolf just became part of this turmoil at the Tourbillon to try and fill in this terrible vide. The two brothers uh, died um, in a car accident um, in the south of France, coming back from Corsica. It was my car. I just want to, to look at the magazines, all the newspapers telling this story. And, uh, for me, it was very important to... ...to not think anymore. No. She was very, very strong in a way. But she need to be surrounded with friends and she don't want to be alone anymore. So she was with us all the time. Nureyev was the discovery of the Paris saw for the audience. Um, and to an extent, the glory he brought to the Kirov in Paris reflected on everyone. <laughs> At that point, they had been so successful that the Kirov was supposed to move to an arena that had 5,000 seats to fill, the Palais des Sports. The Palais des Sports was a challenge. To fill 5,000 seats in that era was a challenge. They didn't know if it could be done with a ballet. Здравствуйте, Наталья Михайловна. Минуточку, можно вас? Продолжайте, я смотрю. Продолжайте. But in response to Strzeszewski's reports, Moscow decided to issue a recall order for Nureyev. Это оттуда. Это отзыв Нуреева обратно в Москву, в наказание. Наталья, что нам делать? Это катастрофа. Well, it put Sergeyev in a very difficult position. And Sergeyev knew that Nureyev was meant to open Swan Lake. Responsibility for the success of the tour came to lie with the Soviet embassy. Reading their reports, it is clear the ambassador became involved. He tried to save the tour by keeping Nureyev in Paris against the recall order from Moscow. Now, ironically, Sergeyev has to become Nureyev's protector. Здравствуйте. Рудольф, мне надо с вами поговорить. Скоро мы едем в Лондон. 
Я требую прекратить прогулки по Парижу, вечеринки и всякие встречи. Вы меня слышите? Я запрещаю вам встречаться с вашими французскими друзьями. Понятно? Закончим? Закончим. Разрешите мне поработать. Was extraordinary for him the freedom was something new and you know for instance they asked him to don't go with us he said one have to hide myself behind the iron curtain i'm there to profit of life i will go he have his own character very strong the first opening night of swan lake in the third act he stopped the orchestra during the performance He stand up and he said... The whole auditorium went quiet. And of course, Sergeyev was furious against him. Furious, furious, furious. Nothing like this had ever happened before. And he came back and uh, he said to the conductor, you could go. And in myself, I said, my God, you have to dance much better than ever. So he started to dance and he danced beautifully. And the next day, the press wrote that Nuriyev, with a regal gesture, stopped the orchestra and demonstrated his virtuosity. That made him feel invincible. And from this point, his success reached new heights. He became intoxicated with himself and started to think that anything was allowed. Сколько сейчас времени? Разница между мной и вами то, что вы никогда не сможете сделать то, что делаю я. Поэтому сидите здесь как крыса. Of course, all of this tried Strzhevsky's patience. Strzhevskoy. Можете делать то, что делаю я. Ты кто такой? Ты кто такой? You never know what can explode a person from the inside. That was a hard mission for Strzhevsky. Yuri didn't tell me much about what happened between him and Rurik that night, but I heard the rumors. The forbidden fraud is too sweet, so to speak. I don't know exactly what happened, but when you share a room on tour, it's natural to ask your roommate for a massage. I don't want to talk about it. Yuri never told me what happened about that. He made hints and... Alla Sipienka told me, yes, there was some incident. Yuri. 
yes, there was some incident. That's why Yuri pushed him out and they parted company. Ну, Юрочка, как тебе твой номер? Все устраивает? Спасибо. Вот тебе твой ключ. Располагайся. Да, спасибо. Тунурий всегда ведущий. Ты на вторых ролях. Неужели тебе это устраивает? А ведь хочется, наверное, главной роли, да? Все в порядке. He needed to do anything at this point to turn the mission to his advantage. It was his right to use the influence of other members of the company against Nureyev. You want me to bring it? Yes. No. Yes, Yura. That's what I want. And between the other, Yura, the law in our country has never been changed. Юра, до меня дошли слухи, что Рудольф собирается остаться в Париже. Ты меня пей за ним, посмотри за ним, внимательнее, и всю информацию доставишь мне. Насколько я смог понять из оперативных документов? While I was a KGB officer, I was able to see the agent's operative documents. And it's clear, from this moment, Yuri Solovyov became Strzezewski's main informer, and what he had to say made all the difference. You know, they accused me to push Rudolf to leave the company. That I know they did it. And it was so stupid, because if really we want to do it, don't you think so? It was easier to go to the police, even if the KGB was behind us, and said to Rudolf, if you want to leave, you go there and you sign, I want to stay in, in the... It was very straight, very easy. Just before the company was going to move to London, a recall order, a new recall order came in, ordering Noyev back to Moscow. And this time, it could not be avoided. I mean this time, the final ultimatum came from the highest authority, the Central Committee. Could there be any further delay? No. The order said, put him on a plane to Moscow immediately, when the rest of the group is traveling to London. He was, he was not so free. I remember we had a conversation about that. And I said, well, don't be sad because we're going to come to see you in London. I remember I saw a rat, a big rat like this. Ah, a horror. And he said to me, there's many rats in Paris. And I said, yes. I don't know why I remember that and not things more interesting. <laughs> it's bizarre, no? At the airport, I go to, to say hello to Rudolf. They were all there, and immediately Sergei was very, very quiet, very completely different. And uh, we start to talk, we very nicely with Zudinskaya and Sergei, and we talk about completely normally for the first time. And he said to me, "Why don't we have a coffee together?" Okay. 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 Yeah. Rudolf, yeah. no, no, no. Я хочу сказать, пришло письмо из Москвы. Вас отзывают на один концерт в Кремле. And Sergey go to talk to Rudolf, and I stay there with Zudinskaya, uh, drinking my coffee, and I saw Rudolf coming white, completely white. Yeah, you come. 
What? Not going in. And he said, Pierre, you don't know what happened. I'm finished. They want me to come back to Moscow and do something. I don't want. I don't want to come back. I will never dance anymore. Do something for me, or I kill myself. Oh, no. In my place, he saw a paper knife in uh, silver that I, I bought in Mexico. Uh, and he said, oh, I like that. I said, take it, sure, for you. I could not do anything. They took him, and I realized that he was lost. He realized that the danger is there, and he was shaking. He was very, very, very uh, uh, afraid about the situation. I saw the last moments when Rudolf was sitting on a bench with Allah Ostipenko. While everyone else was boarding, I saw that Rudek was in tears. And Allah was trying to console him in her arms. And I still have that picture in my mind. And in my heart, it's an awful thing. I was still there, and then suddenly Vitaly Stryzhevsky pushed me to the departure gate. I turned to see Rudik. He showed me this. He makes that sign. It means prison. And that's it. The curtain closes. And at that point, no one could do anything. I look at the, the, the watch and he said, my God, now look at the time, look at... And suddenly I saw Jean-Pierre Bonnefou. And he came near by me and said, Jean-Pierre, do something. That is the telephone of Clara. Call her and said it's urgent. She has to come because uh, Rudolf has a big problem and we need somebody. Maybe in half an hour it's too late. We cannot do anything. I was sleeping <laughs> because we spent a lot of the night walking. Oui. I knew Clara Saint, I said yes, and, I, and he said I am at uh, l'aéroport du Bourget, and uh, I just spoke with uh, Nureyev, and please come, he wants to see you. And I said, but uh, he, he's going to have the plane to London. L'avion est parti, il est en cours là. No, no, the plane already left. Dans moins une demi-heure, j'arrive dès que je peux. During that time, the KGB said, listen, Mr. Lacotte, don't stay here. Look, he look at you. He thinks that you could do something. And of course, you could not do anything. And suddenly, behind me, uh, Clara was there. And she said, what can I do? I said, Cla Clara, you have to do something immediately. And uh, I went to him, and uh, the bodyguards went to me, and they said, what do you want? And I said, I want to speak to my friend. OK. Well, they, they were not very afraid of me, I think. It's too big. Uh, and um, he said to me, please do something. And I said, are you sure you want to stay here? And he said, yes, I'm absolutely, absolutely sure. That I remember very well. I saw the, this uh, arrow saying police, first, uh, the first floor. So, so I went there and uh, I said, listen, there is someone downstairs uh, that is with two bodyguards and they want to, to send him by force to Moscow. He's a dancer. And they, they said, are you sure he's a dancer? And I said, yes, I'm sure he's a dancer. And they said, uh, we cannot go to him. We're not allowed to take him. He has to come to us. And I said, OK. He just have to run and said, I want to be free. I said to Clara, of course. But how could you look? The police is around him. What could we do? He said, I went again. 
The man, they, they, they say, well, she's crazy. <laughs> and I said to him, you see these two men, French police, you have to go to them. No, it's, it's like in a ballet, you know, he jumped. <laughs> The French policeman took him, and the two bodyguards, you know, they ran, and they, there was a fight between the, one of the, the French policemen and one of the bodyguards. I remember the French policeman said to the Russian, Ah, oh, don't touch me, but screaming. On est en France ici. My uncle, Mr. Gregory Alexinsky, he worked uh, in Le Bourget as a commissaire, he was responsible of the security of Le Bourget. He spoke with Rudolf in Russian. Dumont. You are Russian, right? It's a joke. You are also Russian. You are also Russian. Что у вас случилось? Рассказывайте. I think when you met him, you were impressed because he had this kind of calm of the hero, you know, the people who can deal with danger. I, I remember this office. Mademoiselle, no. Rudy asked a thing for a cognac. He was really like this. And they said to me, um, the first thing he has to, to, to have papers. Et puis, like 20 minutes after I arrived the, the attaché culturel de l'ambassade de Russie. Oh, but Rudy, you, you cannot do that to us. You, oh my God. My God, but it's crazy, you know, you're going to go to Russia, you're going to be such a star. You don't, we don't want to, to do nothing to you. We respect you so much. My uncle said, he said that the, his office was a small office and it was probably very chaotic with uh, the Russian and the, the French. In this office, there were two doors. So he, he asked Rudolf to decide if he wanted to take the plane with the Russian angels of the KGB or wanted to stay in Paris, France. He had to choose. This is a beautiful idea. It's very simple and it's very abstract. Two doors. You take the left uh, door or the right door, and it's not the same hand, you know? They said to me, do you have some place to put him because they're going to to follow him and, uh, uh, and I said, yes, I have a friend, uh, no problem. And he cannot go outside. I said, okay, uh, don't go and see him because you're going to be followed. The real story, it is such an incredible story that a man uh, escaped at the time from the KGB. He is the most famous world dancer, he's very beautiful, he's very young, he's a dandy, and he's flamboyant, you know, flamboyant, and he jumps. He jumped, he escaped, he was the winner. He had a very good instinct of people. 
and he had this ability to meet the right people at the right time. It's like a second like film, enfin. It was like there was not in the story. It's very strange. Next morning, on the way to breakfast in the lobby, there was a newspaper with a photograph of Rudolf dressed in white, making a stage leap, and the headline, Dance to Freedom. It was on the whole page, the jump to the free world. We were so shocked. We went into our hotel room and quietly whispered, telling each other it could not have happened. It must be a mistake. Our Rudik couldn't have done it. He couldn't have done it. It was a betrayal of our motherland. This was my feeling. The story hit like an atom bomb, and the blast wave grew into legend. After Rudik defected, in London I was locked in my room. I was let out only to go to rehearsals and the shows. Can you believe that? It was horrible how I was treated. I was a belly dancer with a reputation known all over the world. The West could claim a victory in the Cold War. That was the simple message of the New Era of Defection. We are freedom. We are an open society. We permit artistic expression. Nureyev has escaped to achieve his artistic goals, and he can only do that, so the West claimed, within the, within the West. So it was a huge, a huge propaganda coup. The Soviet Union had a very strong interest in not publicizing this, because after all, from their point of view, it, it was a propaganda disaster. Not least, fortunately, Epin, head of the, of the, of the KGB. The letter Shelepin wrote after Nureyev's defection is the explanation from the KGB head of what had happened. It reveals he never knew what was going on. The whole thing had caught him off guard. This story of Le Bourget was so much a tragedy for the KGB, a proof that the KGB was absolutely not competent at all. So the first thing that the KGB has to do is, is to destroy this, this uh, uh, defector. And Nureyev knows that. He must have been terribly moved and in a terrible turmoil. Waking every morning wondering where he is. I mean, every awakening must have been difficult for a long time. He found himself trapped in an apartment that he couldn't leave for fear that the KGB would find him. The irony is, when he defected, that wild animal whom the world was seeing or imagining to be free, all of a sudden was finding himself in a cage again. I was living there, but it was a big apartment, really nice on the Jardin du Luxembourg. And uh, he, he had nothing, so I went to, to buy a toothbrush and uh, sh shirts and uh, jeans and, uh, and all these things. He had nothing, nothing, nothing. Norev was in danger. Even at, at the, the day after, the KGB were in front of all the apartments of Clara Saint, of Pierre Lacotte. Two KGB was in front of my place. Somebody was running. They called me. It was a newspaper. Listen, I would like uh, to know where is Rudolf Neuf. I said, I don't know. Mais vous devez savoir. Vous êtes très proche de lui. Why you lie? You have to tell us. We need to for uh, our information for the newspaper. I said. Je vous dis que je ne sais pas. And they said, I will give you some money. I said, I don't want anything. And they were ready to sign a check. I said, 
I don't don't want to. Do, and I don't know where he is. And I even if I know where he is, I never tell you. When I hang up. What I know is that Nureyev was very, very anxious. He was scared. And he was, he was right to be afraid. Because the KGB had plans to, uh, to destroy him. There is a version that Nikita Khrushchev gave an order to break Nureyev's legs to end his dancing career. Really? I don't deny that in private he was so furious he could drop a phrase like that, as we say, but that he ordered it, that he would action it, it's unthinkable in this context. Nureyev had no scientist secret, that's true. He just had one thing, he offended the government and he betrayed his country. The London premiere was in three days' time. Sergeyev was in a panic trying to think what to do. For him, it was a life or death question. He would carry the can unless he could make the show a triumph. He approached Solofiev to take over Sleeping Beauty and by there, I did Swan Lake. We had no time to introduce young Yuri Solovyov into the show, and we were rehearsing day and night. He wasn't tall enough for me, so I wasn't full fingers. Rudin unwittingly gave him his break and he moved into the role of a soloist. I felt it would have been better if it happened gradually. Instead of maturing, it came in a rush of panic. You know, everything was difficult. I said to, to, to Clara, Rudolf, now he have to walk. You know, he was going crazy. Where have you been? This холодно, как в могиле. Don't like the shirts. It's too big. Didn't like the shirt I bought. Молчишь. Can you believe it? Can you do something? Как как-то. I don't like that shirt because no, ah, but these jeans, and you know the apartment I'm staying is full of marble. I said yes, it's a very beautiful place. Yes, but it's cold. It's very bad for me. It's cold. Merci beaucoup, je dis. Thank you very much. He have to walk. And we talked about, I said, what about uh, in Paris Opera? It's impossible. Politically, it was a national theater. They could not take uh, somebody who escaped from Russia, otherwise, never the company will go in Russia anymore. Raimundo, it's at one. Just with The only thing was uh, the ballet company of uh, Marquis de Cuivas. And I was worried, don't Clara called um, Raimundo de Lara. Raimondo de Larin was the director of the ballet of the Marquis de Cuevas. Raimundo, I called him. He said, no, tell him I, I hired him. 
We are going to produce uh, Sleeping Beauty. And Nureyev had seen Sleeping Beauty. He met Raimundo de la Rain, uh, during his tour with the Kirov, and he, he told him that the production was awful and the costumes were so kitsch. And two weeks after his defection, what did he then? Sleeping Beauty with the Marquis de Cuevas company. <laughs> There was a press conference in the morning at the Théâtre des Champs-Élysées. Of course, I was there, but there were also hundreds of journalists and photographers. I will never return my country, but I can never be happy in yours. The whole world was watching, so the KGB couldn't do anything. Nothing could have been worse for Russia than if they had tried to get to him at that point. He had the event, the main event in Bali world. Raimondo had it in his hands from the moment Rudolf accepted to come. Well, he came like a un grand fauve, I mean, you're like a wild animal. And we were fascinated. I was especially fascinated by the way he worked. He would lock himself up somehow when he wanted to be alone. Uh, with the pianist into the foyer of the Théâtre des Champs-Élysées and he would do his own class. Rudolf told me that he was redoing carefully, precisely the class of Pushkin, not to forget it, not to lose his shape. One thing he was very afraid of by passing to the West is to lose his shape because he, he didn't, would, wouldn't have the same training anymore. So he used to do that class very slow, very... It was fascinating. I had never seen somebody work so thoroughly with so much precision and slowly correct a movement until it was perfect. This was absolutely incredible. On the night of Nureyev's debut as the bluebird in Sleeping Beauty, he asked that nobody disturb him in his dressing room. But a journalist managed to get in and gave him three letters one from his father, one from his mother, and one from his coach, Pushkin. All of them told him he could not betray his homeland. They all told him to come back and that there would be no punishment. I think it was the communists, of course, who want to organize a big evening against Rudolf to make him afraid and to shock everybody to say, look, that boy, he did something wrong, he's leaving his own country. But only the communists could think that way. That evening, everything was done to demoralize him. He understood this straight away and he was furious. Then, as he approached the stage, he heard abuse coming from the auditorium. It was not spontaneous, it was really organized. You could, you could feel that. When he came from the wings, he came very close to, to my left, and I remember his eyes. He was in total panic. They were yelling, traitor, go back to your country. They were throwing coins, broken glass on stage. They did everything possible to unnerve him, but he kept going. That was for me the proof of his, uh, the strongness of his character. In the middle of all that situation, he proved his own personality, this is strength. That day, he really became free. He had broken off with everything from the past. He wanted to learn, he wanted to know, he wanted to do, he wanted more. He didn't want to be uh, bloqué. Uh, he didn't accept the fact to be limited. It is so right, I mean, he wanted to conquer the world. And it, it was his right to conquer the world. His perfect right. How dare the people stop him from that?
When we got back, they declared Nureyev to be an enemy of the nation and that he committed treason. That's what they always used to say when people did something extraordinary. I remember it like yesterday, the day they returned to Russia. I had to find out what happened from Yuri Solyov. Yuri, I want to know the truth. They say that he's a traitor. Tell me, did he really plan to go back? Там он хотел остаться. Он копил деньги, ничего почти не покупал, был под влиянием своих французских друзей. Я тебе не верю. Так или иначе, это произошло. Все уже спрашивали. Everyone was asking, how could it have happened? What did happen? Yuri was taken repeatedly to the Grey House, the KGB headquarters. Of course he was influenced. They put pressure on him. It took a heavy toll. That pressure didn't stop. It continued relentlessly. We used to talk sometimes in the locker room. Sergei, he said, What a success we've become. But what's the point of it all? He was sinking into some darkness. And this inclination this would not have taken place if Rudik hadn't defected. It was a complex time, I think, you know. Don't understand what is this about this guy. That was kind of thing that you never feel that you know everything about it. And I think with Rudolf, uh, we don't know everything. My feeling is that it was decided in advance that Rudolf would leave to stay in France. It's possible. Uncle Greg, I remember that what he told me when I asked him one day, what, what's happened exactly? He said in the morning there was a call telling me that something could happen. I had to be very careful and to help somebody who was probably going to escape the Russian guards to come inside the French frontier. The final order to secure Nureyev's immediate return to Moscow at the airport was a provocation. The final push to make this man take that step. I am completely convinced that the Central Committee really knew what they were doing. Вы должны его контролировать. Вот да. да. Спасибо, товарищ посол. They were provoking Nureyev in order to make a strike against the KGB chief Alexander Shelepin. The Central Committee really didn't like Shelepin. He was a rival to their power, and they would do anything to get rid of him. He was kept in the dark, and he missed it. His security services failed to prevent the defection of Nureyev. And thanks to this event, Shelepin was taken down. Why do you think Shelepin was deposed? 
Well, I, I'm sure this was connected. This was surely, it must have been connected to, to the defection. There was also an extraordinary degree of factionalism, pure power struggles, control of the political agenda. This is what happens when you open up to the West. This is what happens when you try to engage the West and allow people to travel to the West. You're gonna end up with these kinds of disasters. How somebody has the ability in the life to escape is difficult to say. But I think some, some people uh, have uh, luck in their blood, you know. I don't remember very well, but after all that, he became a star, of course. We went with him uh, to this uh, shooting, and um, I've then said to me, you know, you can stay now, but then you have to leave because I want to photograph him naked. And I said, okay, yes, I'm not going to stay. <laughs> How long? And he said, oh, well, come back in one hour if you want. What do you think you meant to him? I don't know. Did he love you? No, I don't think so. No, he, he thought he, that I was an interesting person. I was free. I didn't work in that time. I was completely free. Everything was easy with me, you see? But you know, he was such a star. I was, I was happy for him. And this is the last time I will speak of Rudolf Meyer because... Thank you.